Oh, it's here and it is great. It is the 2022 My Guys episode. Nine flags will be planted on today's episode. We have breaking news. And make sure right now you like the video and in the comments, say who's my guy you like the best or who you don't like the best. Enjoy this show. In a world where the line between success and failure can be measured in fractions of a point, three gentlemen, nay, heroes, have put aside their differences to combine forces and produce the greatest fantasy football draft kit of all time. Many said that it couldn't be done. Many said it shouldn't be done. But the desire to be the best, the passion to rise above the rest, has pointed these podcasters on a one-way path to fulfill their destiny. This summer, from the creative minds behind the fantasy footballers, comes a blockbuster multimedia extravaganza, the likes of which has never been seen. Video profiles, stat projections, tier breakdowns, printable cheat sheets, rookie rankings, sleepers, busts, and so much more. Mike Wright calls it the one draft tool you can't miss. Andrew Holloway says it's changed his life. And Jason Moore said, when I saw all the content in the Ultimate Draft Kit, I fell to my knees and wept. I wept like a baby. Don't miss this opportunity. Go to www.ultimatedraftkit.com today and secure your copy today. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ladies and gentlemen, take your seats, because it's football time. Hey! Part (laughs) two. Oh, welcome into the show. They're all seated now. I just wanted people to be careful. Thursday, August 18th. Some people like, drive standing up. Well, I mean... Very I, dangerous. We have a responsibility to keep yeah. people safe. Something that um, many of the artists uh, in the Woodstock 99 did not do. Yes. I, I mean, and I, a great friend of the show, Nitsa, doesn't... Do, they don't like standing while no, you're driving. No, I, I just finished the Woodstock documentary... And it was frightening. <laughs> People are <laughs> awful. Uh, welcome into the Fantasy Footballers. Mike Wright, Jason Moore, Andy Holloway. Very special episode today. It only happens once per year. The My Guys episode. I think we have done this since the beginning, right? That is correct. So this is probably our eighth My Guys. <clears throat> Incredible. <sighs> Always difficult. Yes, I mean, this is flag planting time, and you associate your name with a player forever, even if, I don't know, by chance you didn't actually make them a my guy, and then, like, you know, you changed it, and then and then people still <laughs> bring up Dante Pettis years later. Oh, I so, thought that was it was just a really, you know, a circumstance that's never happened. And you're just like, it's a theory, we a have, hypothesis. Yeah, we, we have had... We've had the my guy get injured in week one. That's a huge disappointment. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, We've had it multiple times, right? Uh, You you had a Blake Jarwin experience at one point in time. I had a Raheem Mostert experience. That's disappointing because you just don't get to find out the the truth. Correct. Um, But, yeah, we you know, you associate your name with a player, someone that you have great conviction about, that you believe in, that you're targeting in drafts. I mean, that's a big part of being a my guy is – you know, we're making this decision based on the draft value and the draft cost as well, not just are they going to be good, right? So um, very, very excited about uh, today's show. We do have a huge giveaway that is culminating tomorrow on a live stream, and we are giving away the ultimate draft kit for life. So 
Uh, the Ultimate Draft Kit is our draft tool that we have built and improved upon and uh, been releasing for years. You can get it at ultimatedraftkit.com. It is jam-packed. It is the best value it's ever been. But we're also going to give away a UDK for life, which means you're going to get it for free forever. Uh, and we're going to give it away on a live stream tomorrow, 6.30 Eastern, 3.30 Pacific. The live stream starts at 6. So if you want to participate, ask questions, that's at 6 Eastern. We'll give it away during the live stream oh, okay. at 6.30 Eastern. That's the so, better time to know about. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we'll be on YouTube, that's on Twitter, on Twitch, on Facebook. Yeah, so you got to order it by the end of that live stream. But okay. I would get it right now. Get in there. Get prepped for your draft. UltimateDraftKit.com, and then we'll give it away at the end of the live stream tomorrow. And uh, that is going to be very exciting. No quick question today. A little bit of news I want to get into, but really, I, I want us to get to the main event, right? I'm I want to so spend. Excited. I want to spend enough time talking about these players. Uh, if the other two guys have some things to bring up, concerns, thoughts, um, what you know, want to get on the same bandwagon, whatever the case may be. But here's a little bit of news that we have: Ken Walker. He undergo uh, he underwent surgery for a, a hernia, not considered a regular. Yeah, just an OG. Yeah, run just, of the mill hernia. You know, just uh, just a salt of the earth. It's a <laughs> regular old hernia. So I mean, it's good that it's not a core muscle injury, a sports hernia that will take you out um, longer. They are still hoping that he is available for week one, but I mean, this is clearly a a setback. He can't practice. He's having you know surgery, so. Um, you know, the next few weeks, he will not be participating. And I don't think that there is a world that exists where he is uh, ready to go week one and he's the dude. Like, that's all, that's that's not in the cards now. If you are going to draft Ken Walker in a redraft league, you are doing so to hold on to him so that hopefully as the weeks go on, he comes into form and, and gets the opportunity later. He's a talented player, but the surgery is certainly a setback for a rookie. Darren Waller returned to practice. Finally. So that's good news. Um, was dealing with a hamstring injury. Probably still is, to be honest. Uh, but recovered enough to get back to practice. Baker Mayfield to be named the starter for the Panthers. Oh, my gosh. What? Expected. 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 It has not happened yet to our knowledge. Yeah, this is Jeff Howe of The Athletic reporting that, and I'm sure that when Matt Ja Rule hears this, he's going to say, no, 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 yeah. no, 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 not yet. I don't want my starter to have full practice. And then uh, we did get an update on McCole Hardman. Yesterday had been carted off. Uh, he has made his appearance on groinindex.com. Yeah. But uh, according to Andy Reid, dealing with a groin spasm. <laughs> oh, oh, that's... Is that a different sound you make? Yeah. Like if it's just a groin pull, it's an ah. Yes. I mean. But this is a spasm. This is the first time I can recall that when we've been alerted to that someone has the groin injury which it's the uh, it's funny word groin injury not funny if you've ever had one. no they no. are very unpleasant uh but this is the first time I can recall it being called a groin spasm uh not a serious so, groin spasm okay that's, that's great crisis averted yeah, yeah it is I mean look the groin is near the private and so yeah. we're all children here yes and we, it's, it's just so funny the private <laughs> It's my private dodo parts. Uh, <laughs> Welcome to the My Guys episode. <laughs> I don't have any other groin related or otherwise news here on the podcast. Kyle's in the building. Kyle, how you doing? My groin is fine. Oh, I, didn't, right, I great, didn't ask. Great, great I didn't ask. Great to um, hear. Al, you doing all right? Doing great. Thank you. Okay. You excited about the My Guys? Oh, yeah. It's time. So oh, yeah. good. <laughs> Everything about that is just out of control. Uh, if you're listening, there is a um, <clears throat> questionable like a oh, it's video graphic that took place. No questions about it. It's fantastic. Okay. All right. I guess I'm going to kick this thing off. We ready? We did put some polls up on Twitter, and we asked people to guess who they think are my guys were for today's show did did you get any hits i did there were there were a couple hits uh three of three yes, yes. i i 
Did not see any three of three for mine, Jason. I scoured and I found one three of three. Plenty oh. of people had two of three and different yeah. twos of threes, yes. and and all three were mentioned, but only one person that I saw had all three. And yeah, some were very close. Uh, it's always interesting to read those replies because it just gives you a gauge of like who you've been talking about and who they associate with you on the show. Uh, I think this one was the most common name that I saw in the guesses. So kick it off. Allen Robinson. Oh, man. Wide receiver for the <sighs> Los Angeles Rams this going. Is, this is dangerous territory. Oh, it's as dangerous <laughs> as it gets, man. This is blindfold on through the minefield. Allen Robinson who is being drafted around the sixth round as the wide receiver 23. The story of Allen Robinson has always been this laundry list of quarterbacks that never quite get it done for him. But I want to remind you, I want to go in some different directions here with Allen Robinson. First of all, his head coaches have been Gus Bradley, Doug Marone, and four years of Matt Nagy. So that's part of the Allen Robinson story. It's unpleasant. But let's trust that wonderful Sean McVay aroma with Allen Robinson because he has given us years of evidence that he can support multiple fantasy wide receivers in this offense. In fact, since he became the head coach in 2017, Sean McVay has targeted the wide receiver position 67% of the targets. That is the most in the NFL. Last year, 73%. Number one in the NFL. They barely throw to the running back. Tyler Higby. The hope has come and gone at the tight end position. The wide receivers are the offense. That's what he's done, and it's a multi-year pattern. And you've seen it with an inferior quarterback in Jared Goff, and Robert Woods was the wide receiver 11 before injury last year. And I just had the privilege of listening to Charles Robinson on the Underdog podcast, who revealed a lot of stuff that he's seen around camp. Talked about sitting there with Sean McVay, just kind of, you know, talking about random things, and then he Sean McVay just brings up how excited they are about Allen Robinson in this offense, how they are shocked they got him at the value that they did, how imp impressive he's been in camp, and how integral he seems to be in this offense. So you're talking about a player in Robert Woods who I think physically we would agree is not what Allen Robinson has been. Correct. Certainly. Uh, Allen Robinson is a, a younger player, a productive red zone threat. He led the NFL in contested catches in 2019 and 2020. That's what he's been known for. Competitive, hands catches, physically winning at the point of attack. And, you know, Cooper Cup had so many touchdowns last year that there's some natural regression for what he was able to do in the red zone. I think you're going to see both of these guys heavily involved. One of them could be the number one pick in your draft could be the number three pick in your draft one of them's being drafted at the end of the fifth round or the early sixth round I think that Allen Robinson and I'll say it to put a capstone on this I think Allen Robinson ends up as a wide receiver one this year oh and maybe oh. at the very back end of that one range but I think he's going to be the uh potential one of the biggest fantasy MVPs this year he is a my guy for 2022 and as scary as it is, I'm going to go on record and say that I believe Allen Robinson and Matthew Stafford, that connection, that player that knows how to put the ball where he's supposed to, on the play that he's supposed to, and Sean McVay, it's going to be a wonderful, beautiful, we should have seen it coming moment. I hate <laughs> that I think you're right. <laughs> We, oh, I know you do. Yeah, I mean, we we had a trade in Dynasty where I, I sent Allen Robinson your way. Uh, I was done with Allen Robinson. Genuinely thought he was washed. You, the, the stats that you have last year that he had were so horrific. It just didn't seem like something that could have been alone given to the quarterback or the head coach. He was just so outrageously bad. But the reality is he hasn't hit an age threshold that he should be done. He hasn't had an injury that says he should be done. He was paid like a superstar, and now he's with McVay and Stafford. He should be really, really, really good. I, I completely agree with you. I think he's he's a pretty much locked and loaded wide receiver, too. Now, the wide receiver one 
shot that you're calling, that is that is definitely on of the spicy variety. Yeah, I mean, take take your Pepto Bismol when it's, you draft them, but you're not paying for a wide receiver one. You're paying for a late fifth round, early sixth round pick that has the terror of every everybody is more people are in your boat. I'm done with Allen Robinson. Something will go wrong. Now, look, if Matthew Stafford's elbow is a problem, we're going to be rolling our eyes. Um, Before we get to the next my guy, we yep. have to hit it. Breaking news. Incredibly, in the midst of this show, we get uh, pretty significant breaking news. I've seen it confirmed by multiple sources. Uh, again, this is live for us. But the NFL and the NFLPA agreeing on a settlement for quarterback Deshaun Watson suspended 11 games, fined $5 million. There is now a proof of the ruling showing up, and this seems final. So you you finally have an answer to when he's going to return. It's not going to be for a long while. Um, for fantasy purposes, Deshaun Watson is going to start, you know, what, Six, six games yep. before the fantasy playoffs uh, begin. So, well, quick, not before quick, the fantasy playoffs. Sorry, for the entirety of the season, yeah. in, including reactions to this news. Um, uh, you know, the, to me, he's undraftable in redraft uh, for sure. And in best ball, you're, even there, you're getting only six games. If you're in any kind of tournament, um, you can hope that maybe you're getting him for the playoffs, but you've got to get to the playoffs with him. So people that drafted him in the last round, maybe they uh, got an accidental asset because he will have games. But as far as how it affects uh, Amari Cooper and David Njoku and all of the receiving options there for redraft purposes, I don't think it changes anything. There is no chance that I'm going to say, well, now I'll draft Amari Cooper because – months from you know three months from now I'll be able to play him with Deshaun Watson if you want to um go after him you know find him on the waivers or uh, you know or trade for him and there's there's also no guarantee that when he comes back after this much time off yeah he'll be he vintage. just is is hot I mean he looked terrible in his preseason yeah. games so. by the way they have a bye week in week nine so he won't actually be eligible to come back until the following week because he needs to and it, and somehow and it's <laughs> against Houston <laughs> How could they do that? Oh, come on. Come on. Because week nine won't count at, towards the suspension. So you will go through 11 games and then week 13. So he's not playing until December this year, everybody. Right. So I, I'm assuming what you're saying is Njoku, Cooper, David Bell, all of those players, you're not drafting with any consideration of Deshaun Watson's addition. Exactly. Uh, and so like to me, the wide receivers, like Amari Cooper was – no one is ever off the board, you know, like with these Correct. Like in the, in the, in the, the uh, fantasy football draft, there comes a point where you're like, yeah, I should take a shot on the value of Amari Cooper, but he's been pretty close to, I'm just, I don't see the upside for him with everything going on and just his lack of production last year. But so the, the wide receivers are pretty close to, I don't really want anything to do with them. The running backs are still fine. And David Njoku is still fine to me as a late round uh dart throw at the tight end position it we do expect it would be Jacoby Brissett because they kind of shot down the uh the, the rumors of of Jimmy Garoppolo or just anybody else coming in really at this point and Jacoby Brissett targets the tight end position very frequently um I can't remember the stat off the top of my head but uh like him Lamar are, and maybe Carson Wentz it was, but just he's one of the quarterbacks that just his tendency is to go to that player, to that position, and, and Joku paid, uber athlete, so he's still interesting to me. Well, we'll take a very quick break and then come back full force with the remaining eight my guys. Allen Robinson, the first one. Jason gets to go next in just a minute. Mr. Moore, uh, the world is waiting in anticipation for your, my guy, Brandon Ayuk. I, <laughs> I will lead it off with the most common guess for a my guy. This shouldn't be surprising. 
it's a quarterback you can draft this year. I'm talking about Jalen Hurts, my guy. I love Jalen Hurts. Y'all know I love Jalen Hurts. It's not a surprise. I've talked him up. In fact, last year, I made a water bet with Andy that I won, that he would be a top <laughs> nine quarterback despite having a bottom 10 receiving core. Now, I could make a lot of very easy arguments for Jalen Hurts. I could say that the dude finished as the quarterback six. And I will. I say you could. Oh, no, I would never. I would, I would say that, you know, he could, he finishes the quarterback six despite only throwing 16 passing touchdowns. And now he gets AJ, uh, AJ Brown, but I don't need to say that. You know, I could say, oh, he averages more rushing attempts per game than Lamar Jackson, but I won't. Right. You know, I could, I could bring up the fact that with a majorly upgraded wide receiver core, uh, DraftKings Sportsbook has Jalen Hurts betting line set at 725 rushing yards, eight and a half rushing touchdowns still, but you all probably knew that already. Yeah, I wouldn't bring that up. Yeah, no, I wouldn't. What is happening? And, and finally, I, you know, I could bring up like, oh, what about the wonderful... We've given him a stage and he's just... <laughs> what about the wonderful ADP where he's going behind Kyler, behind Lamar, behind Mahomes and Herbert in drafts? He's landing in the sixth round currently... Right now, on Sleeper, sitting between TJ Hawkinson and Miles Sanders. No, I'd keep that quiet, um, too. Jalen Hurts, please. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to keep that under wraps. <laughs> you guys understand already. You understand his, his, his floor is great. His upside is that he's this year's fantasy football game breaker. If he throws for near 4,000 yards and 25 touchdowns while rushing for 750 and 8. But I don't need to bring any of that up because instead, I want to play a game. Oh, uh, right. I want to play a game. Now, is this one of those uh, involved? Like, we don't have a choice, right? Well, that's, that, is, that is correct. I, well, uh, usually the, the, the those games, they're pretty involuntary <laughs> yes, as well. Yes. All right. You just kind of wake up and you're playing a game. This game is called Jalen Hurts or Patrick Mahomes. Oh, baby. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right, I love Mike. These since games. you're excited, let me ask you first. Jalen Hurts. <laughs> oh. Since Jalen Hurts became a starter in Week 14 of 2020, who has more fantasy points per game, Jalen Hurts or Patrick Mahomes? Patrick Mahomes. Incorrect. Oh man! It is also not Jalen Hurts. They are tied at 21.3 fantasy points per okay. game right. since Hurts has become a starter. Andy, who do you think has more interceptions, Patrick Mahomes or Jalen Hurts? In total? In total. Since Jalen Hurts started? That is correct. As a starter. I'm, I'm guessing it's it's going to be Patrick Mahomes. It is Patrick Mahomes. 17 to 12. Now, that's a little not fair because during that time, passing Mahomes, volume. Mahomes he, has more passing volume. He also has one more game. He's yeah. played one more game okay. than Jalen Hurts during oh, that okay. stretch. This is a setup. It is. You're right. <laughs> Hook, line, and sinker. Mike, who has more top 12 weeks, Patrick Mahomes or Jalen Hurts during that span? Keep in mind, Mahomes has the extra game. Ooh, I'm going to go. I think it's Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts. Yeah, I think it's Hurts. Oh, man, you guys are dumb. They tied. They both oh, had man. They both had 13. This game is doo-doo. <laughs> um, well, who had more top, you know, 25-plus points okay. weeks? Because, you know, we Patrick talked. Patrick Mahomes. Ooh, actually, it's tied again. They both have had it six times. But the <laughs> second to last question, um, who's had – more games with fewer than 15 points. Those Tied. bad games. No, that's got to be Matt Mahomes. That is Mahomes. Yeah. Five oh. to three. So since Jalen Hurts has become a starter in week 14, he has basically been genuinely better for fantasy than Patrick Mahomes during that stretch. Now I ask the final question. Oh, boy. Which one of these quarterbacks lost a top 10 NFL wide receiver? I'm not playing oh, anymore. It's now, now one's tied. No, because oh. one of these quarterbacks gained a top 10 NFL wide receiver. So the upside here is that Jalen Hurts can up his passing game. His rushing game is known. He gets A.J. Brown. He's already been great. Draft him in the sixth round. Dare I say, annoyingly compelling. Thank you. Mike, All right. let's uh, hand you the baton. Well, my Don't be quite as obnoxious. Oh, I, I can't be. Impossible. But I want to play a game. No. No. <laughs> All right, my first, my guy, uh, I'm going to go with the, the the most common answer because this has been an entire offseason of just a love fest for me 
And wide receiver Cortland Sutton of the Denver Broncos currently going a, on, on sleeper as the wide receiver 20. Cortland Sutton has everything that you want in a wide receiver one. He's already broken out 1,100 yards and six touchdowns as a second-year wide receiver. He's got the bag. He was just extended last year and is 26 years old, still heading into the prime of his NFL career. Downfield threat, the second highest A dot among wide receivers last year at 15.4. He is a true downfield weapon. The question for Cortland Sutton has always been the quarterback play. Case Keenum, Joe Flacco, Drew Locke, Teddy Bridgewater. These are the star, guys. star, star, star. These All pro. are the quarterbacks that Cortland Sutton has had to deal with. In fact, since 2018, here are the passing touchdown totals for these quarterbacks from Denver. 19, 16, 21, and 20. Only Carolina, the Jets, and Washington had fewer passing touchdowns in that span. Cortland Sutton said this about his new quarterback, Russell Wilson. The juice is just different. And what mm. what are we talking about here? Steroids. <laughs> Whoa, whoa. Well, you said the juice. Whoa. That's, these are synonyms. They're, <laughs> they're synonyms? The juice? Yeah, isn't that people are juicing? I mean, sure. Yeah. yeah I'm not sure. That, go on, Mike. Anyways, Russell. I thought Wilson. it was Sunny D, but whatever. Go on. <laughs> OJ, purple stuff. Uh, Russell Wilson always has at least one top 15 wide receiver. And look, I mean, Jerry Judy, he could be a solid wide receiver. We just we don't know through 26 NFL games. Andy, you highlighted him uh, a little bit in the ice show of just we haven't seen it from Jerry Judy. He's had plenty of opportunity. We just we have not seen it. But Russell Wilson, his offenses super efficient, always like basically always top ten in points per game. And Russell Wilson has the most end zone pass attempts over the past four years. He likes to throw into the end zone. He likes to throw that moon ball and like. Just in your head when you're thinking, well, Tyler Lockett, the smaller guy, the speed guy, that's why he was so effective. That's why I was highlighting Cortland Sutton is actually a top-tier downfield threat. He's massive. He can win 50-50 balls. And like with a combination of a very efficient uh, quarterback coming into town with a, a, a wide receiver who's already broken out, I see nothing standing in the way of Cortland Sutton surpassing his ADP and the upside of finishing, at, like Andy said, for Allen Robinson, I think the upside for Cortland Sutton is a top twelve wide receiver. The injury to Tim Patrick it's cleared the path a little bit too. It it, it reduces the risk because I mean the the equation is basically Russ will have a top twelve. So if you're right on who you get and you're right on it being Sutton, not Judy, which it used to be Sutton, not Judy, not Tim Patrick, and some right. other options. Like he's going to have a top twelve guy. He doesn't generally have two of them. But he's got he could he could this year because he's got those weapons consolidated now with the Patrick injury. Um, no, I mean in the beginning of the offseason, I was much more hesitant about Corlin Sutton before camp, before the Patrick injury. Uh, he should be a value in your drafts with tremendous upside week to week. Sometimes fantasy football is easier than we want to, you know, give credit for, which is what both of you two have just done. What's a good wide receiver? who's had bad quarterbacks and now gets a great quarterback. Right. Like, draft those guys. Those guys are going to be better than expectation because you just haven't seen it yet. And the reverse is always true every year. It's it's one of those tips we always leave the season going, man, I got to remember how important that quarterback play is for wide receivers. Well, you're doing it now. Good job, fellas. My second my guy. Well, he's powerful. Yeah, he is. He's mighty. And he's going to be on the field a bunch. We're talking about A.J. Dillon. Aaron Jones was one of the more predicted my guys uh, on Twitter. People thought I'd go with Aaron Jones because I think Ooh. if Jason doesn't get him, I've been taking him in mock drafts. I love Aaron Jones. But Aaron Jones, to me, he's the name brand, right? You pay the premium for Aaron Jones. I love me some Aaron Jones. I love he, the name brand. He's the boxed cereal. Yeah, but A.J. Dillon, he's the he's the Kirkland Costco bulk <laughs> buy in more ways than one. Uh, and not only do you get more of it, but it might just taste better than the name brand on certain weeks. And you get a I mean, you get like a pallet of A.J. Dillon. 
They have to bring him out onto the field he's in a pallet. A, he's is what a big I'm saying. man. It's a forklift to get him out there. Look, A.J. Dillon is uh, just a force. And I think what I – step one is reminding people how many opportunities he had last year. This was something that, you know, they split work between these two guys. They had exactly six goal line carries each in 2021. They both had over 220 touches. Aaron Rodgers just recently came out and said, look, we have to have our best 11 players out on the field – and those two guys, speaking of Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon, are two of the best 11. And he's not just an early down back. That's another misconception. Sometimes when you see the big-bodied quadricep monster, you think early down. He had 34 receptions. And Aaron Rodgers, unlike other quarterbacks in football, he takes what's given to him. He takes the easy play. And a lot of the time that means passing and checking down to the running backs, a position that often benefits from targets that depart like Devontae Adams sure. leaving. Dylan averaged more yards per touch last year than DeAndre Swift, than Javante Williams, than Joe Mixon. Whew. So AJ Dillon is the he's the value in the backfield. Over the last decade, when running back teammates see two hundred touches each, they always all end up in the top twenty four. hundred percent of the time. He's going to get more than two hundred touches. Guess where he's being drafted? The RB25. Basically where he was drafted last year, it makes no sense. He's being drafted where he was last year despite finishing inside the top 24. You're getting him out of his floor. The upside is tremendous. Um, and the second running back in those groups always outperforms ADP. I just think A.J. Dillon is going to be an absolute monster. And guess what else you get? Oh, you get massive, massive single game upside. Yeah, and what if Aaron Jones goes down? Exactly. It's not like he hasn't been injured in his career. And when he's out, A.J. Dillon is the show. In Green Bay, he's not viewed as that yet in fantasy, so he's my second my guy. I love it. I love yeah, it. Yeah, I'm in on A.J. Dillon. Them, them quads <sighs> made for stomping. <laughs> You're right. Uh, all right. I'm also going to talk about a running back now. This was my th – this was guessed several times, but rarely. This was uh, more rarely guessed, and I didn't realize it until I was just doing a, uh, a Chase Edmonds search. The correct guess for my three uh, – <laughs> Chase Edmonds is my <laughs> my guy. <laughs> What a reveal! Oh, oh a my reveal. gosh, that was amazing. That was that was great. <laughs> you almost said, "I just gave it away." Um, Chase Edmonds, <laughs> running back for the Miami Dolphins, is the player that I love. I was I was in the middle of doing a yes. Chase Edmonds search just to see if there was any more of the outrageous number of camp reports that are great, and I saw that uh, that it was actually Faye Scissors who had the correct guess of my three my guys. So oh, shout, wow. shout out, you did well. Um, Look, this is a guy that's being left for dead. He's not drafted in the first two rounds. He's not drafted even in the running back dead zone rounds three through seven. He is an eighth rounder right now being drafted as the running back 35. And there are only 32 teams in the NFL. And I looked at my underdog leagues and I wanted to see who am I drafting? Like, I want to put my money where my mouth is. And Chase Edmonds is my third highest rostered running back. He is someone that I believe in. And and I think it's important to follow the money, not just in my leagues, but follow the money of the NFL. He is the perfect fit for the Miami zone blocking scheme with Mike Daniel and the San Francisco system. <laughs> and he was the first running back signed in free agency this offseason. They prioritized him, but so did a lot of teams. Buffalo desperately wanted him, and he said no. Houston reportedly offered him the most money. He said no. He wanted to go where he could prove himself and earn another contract in addition to the two-year, $12 million contract that currently makes him the 12th highest cap hit in the league for running backs. And for reference, Raheem Mostert, Sony Michelle, who were also signed by them this year, 37th and 41st. So the money that the Dolphins are investing is in Chase Edmonds. And the reason is because of the system. Here is a, a tweet from June from Connor Allen NFL where he highlights that the 49ers used zone blocking 282 times last season, the sixth most in the NFL. Chase Edmonds on zone blocking last season, his EPA per play, number one in the league. His yards per attempt, 5.8, 
number one in the league in that system. Edmund said, I wanted to play for Coach McDaniel because of the outside zone scheme. This is not lost on Chase Edmonds. He literally quote tweeted that tweet back in June and said, yeah, this guy gets it. This system is perfect for Chase Edmonds. He is a pass catcher with good athleticism going in the eighth round. Now, I have Chase statted out for only 188 carries and 52 receptions. Very achievable numbers, averaging 14 touches per game. Now, over the last five years, the worst fantasy finish for any running back to hit those marks was the Jets version of Le'Veon Bell, who finished as the running back 22 and he's being drafted as the running back 35. And you might hear all this and you say, look, that's great, Jason. Everything you said is, is, is well thought out. And your, your voice is like butter. And right. your face shines like the morning sun. And, and, and I love you. But what is his ceiling? You know, that mm. might be what you say mm. back to me. And I say, look, over the last two years among qualifying running backs, Chase Edmonds is sixth in fantasy points per touch. The only guys who score more fantasy points at a PPR league than Chase Edmonds when they touch the ball is Leonard Fournette, Aaron Jones, DeAndre Swift, Alvin Kamara, and Austin Eckler. On a per-touch basis, he's really, really great. Last year, the first eight weeks of the season, he was the running back 16 already. You forget it because James Conner was good. And the, the thing about this is a lot of times you have efficient backs and you go, well, if they get the volume – they don't really come through for fantasy. I would have said that maybe out loud with my words. <laughs> but it is the opposite of what has happened with Chase Edmonds in his career. In the games where he gets 12 opportunities or more, he has averaged 14.1 fantasy points per game. Last year, that would have been the running back 12, ahead of Aaron Jones, ahead of DeAndre Swift. He's being paid like the starter. The quotes out of camp are saying... He, you know, uh, the Miami Herald's Barry Jackson said, what's become clear through two weeks of camp is that Chase Edmonds looks poised to become the Dolphins' lead running back. He's perfect for the system, paid well, talented in the past, and he's in the eighth round. Yes. Grab him there. He's a my guy that I am happy to invest my money in. All right, Mike, you are up with... All right, I got a... I my got guy a, number two. I got a value wide receiver here going on sleeper in the ninth round as the wide receiver, 48. And I want to talk about the Lazard King, Alan Lazard, of the Green Bay Packers. Here's where you have to start the story. Devontae Adams, the elite number one wide receiver for the Green Bay Packers, he has been traded away over the offseason. There is a need. There is a hole for the offense of the Green Bay Packers. In comes Alan Lazard. He's 6'5", almost 230 pounds. So he's gigantic on the field, and he's he, he is athletic for that size. This isn't just a lumbering uh, fella out there. Last year, over the final five games, he scored five touchdowns and finished in the top 24 wide receivers at the position four of five weeks on a 16% target share because Devontae Adams was still there. Back in 2020, I know that's a little bit further ago, Alan Lazard was actually starting the season quite hot, but an injury derailed essentially the whole season after three weeks. Rodgers and Lazard, they already have chemistry. Last year, the sixth highest quarterback rating when targeted in the NFL, Alan, Alan Lazard from Aaron Rodgers. The fifth most fantasy points per target. Alan Lazard has a 10.2 average yards per attempt uh, on 151 career targets from Aaron Rodgers. That is Rodgers' second best rate of any wide receiver, trailing only Jordy Nelson. Like, he get when he targets Alan Lazard, he gets yards. What is the competition for Alan Lazard this year? Well, I mean, you have Randall Cobb, who's a bit older, the old Lizard King, Sammy Watkins, and then the people, uh, the guys that, that the fantasy community is excited about, the rookies. Christian Watson, they traded up in the second round to go get him. Romeo Dobbs, been the talk of training camp. But historically, Rodgers just does not target his rookie wide receivers, even the top names. Like, uh, we Which, got. By, by the way, oh, let me just jump in for sure. two seconds. Um, the thought that Aaron Rodgers is now happy with life and not going to grimace a bunch was immediately. Shut down by him ranting and raving against the rookie wide receivers. Yeah, he just put him on blast like yesterday. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. So even the guys that turned great, Devontae Adams, 
38 receptions. Jordy Nelson, 33 receptions. The guy, the actual target leader for a rookie for Aaron Rodgers was Marquez Valdez-Scantling, who is now gone. 40% of the targets with Devontae Adams and MVS, 40% of last year's targets, gone. And now look at Alan Lazard. And these stats are from good friend of the show, Curtis Patrick. He just he happened to be tweeting about this yesterday. And I was like, These, this is juicy. In Rodgers' 14 years as a starter, his yearly wide receiver one has averaged a nearly 27% target share. In 12 of those 14 years, the wide receiver one posted at least 24%. And the lowest mark ever for a wide receiver one for Aaron Rodgers was 2012 Randall Cobb at 21%. 21% for the wide receiver one. You lock in 21% of Rodgers' targets for Alan Lazard, and it's like, well, is he the wide receiver one? Here's a quote from Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, this, this is a good quote. Listen up. Quote, obviously, Alan Lazard is going to step into the number one role, and I think it's going to be a very seamless transition for him. Aaron Rodgers for years has loved Alan Lazard. It just You've had Devontae Adams there to be a true number one. Lazard has the opportunity. He has the faith of his quarterback. The target share historically is there. And Alan Lazard is going in the ninth round. Like, Just think about a perceived wide receiver one for any team going in the ninth round. You're, you're, you're going to be excited for that value, even if it's a crap team. Like That's the number one target for that team, and it's Aaron Rodgers' number one guy. Let me, let me amplify momentarily here, Mike. Please uh, do. The, fi <laughs> the final 10 games of last year, you might have seen a little bit of a glimpse of that trust because despite Devontae Adams being there, and he only had, uh, I think Lazard had like 60 targets on the year or something, or um, sorry, 60 receptions, but 13.6 touchdown pace over the last 10 games last, yes. last year. So you're looking at Alan Lazard with that body and that size, and you're saying, uh, let me have some touchdowns, please. That's his upside. Yeah, I was right. 60 targets, 40 receptions last year. It's interesting, and he's, you know, Rodgers' own words matter here. Yes, they do. And the way it shakes out, look, if Watson had come into camp and been healthy and, you know, Sammy Watkins was, uh, you know, the narrative was different, but right now the narrative's like Rodgers wants his 11 best on the field, Lazard's the guy he trusts. Yeah, it, it. I will say that if, you know, if this was a guy that was going in the fourth or fifth round, I would be very hesitant because I think he's going to find – the NFL a much more difficult place without Devontae Adams on the field and having um, possible. The, the coverage be easier as a more possession type uh, of target, but he doesn't cost you much. In the ninth round, the upside to have 20% of Aaron Rodgers' targets is too good to pass up, so I, I am happy to report I just checked. He's my fourth highest rostered uh, wide receiver, about. so I'm in with you. All right, my final my guy to be revealed right now. <laughs> you should just leak it out, man. Just li just accidentally say That's the how name. The cool kids do. I was it. doing a bunch of Google searches for this guy. Who? What, who? All right, my final my guy is Mike Williams, wide receiver for the Los Angeles Chargers, being uh, deliciously drafted in the fifth round. Uh, this is one of the league's most explosive targets on with one of the NFL's best quarterbacks in a division that is going to be. Filled with fireworks. We remember the story last year. We we know the upside because you saw it with your eyeballs over the first five weeks of the year when he was the number one wide receiver in fantasy football. He finished at 10 on the year despite missing a game and despite dealing with some practice injuries that you know he kind of found his way onto the field. Um, we didn't get a lot of disclosure on what he was dealing with, but things changed in the middle of the year. Well, this is the, the wide receiver that finished at 10 was number one for the first five weeks and is being drafted as the wide receiver 19 right now. What does the team think about him? Jason just made a compelling money-related argument for Chase Edmonds. You have a three-year, $60 million deal with $40 million guaranteed to continue to be the most explosive and physical target for Justin Herbert, who we all adore and love. You're in an up-tempo offense. You've got a quarterback that's going to throw 40 passing touchdowns and you have a receiver that you, you look at what beat reporters are saying about him in camp. This is a – Mike Williams is a complete wide receiver camp. Okay. It's not just down the field, deep ball specialist. This is intermediate route running. 
which we saw last season. Um, you know, you look at last year, his average depth of target previously, he was that deep ball guy before last year, 15.8. Last year it was down at 10.8. They integrated him into the offense as a core piece. Um, and we know in fantasy, we want to inject some volatility into our lineups. We want some high-end outcomes. You want to win a week because Mike Williams went out there and scored three times or put up 204 yards and two touchdowns. He is the perfect middle-round embracing of that volatility with high-end upside. Um, and what if I told you, hey, it's not as good as it can get with what we got from Mike Williams last year. It could be a lot better. He is the kind of wide receiver that belongs in double-digit Mike Evans perennial every year category. He was 10th among wide receivers in expected points in the red zone, but yet finished at 24th in fantasy points in the red zone. Ooh. So he was supposed to score a lot more fantasy points in the red zone and didn't do it. He only secured 4 of 14 end zone targets, which can be a very variable number there. It's big. We've, we saw that happen to Mike Evans. Like Absolutely. Year two where just uh, the – the targets were there, just something was off that year, and, and the and he didn't come through like his rookie year. Yeah, Mike Williams has top five finish potential in his range of outcomes. He can he could put up a season like last year, but end up at fourteen touchdowns instead of nine, and he would be in that top five range. So, um, I I think he can be in a wide receiver one that you get in the fifth round, and that's why he's in my guy. Yeah, we've all we've all loved the value of Mike Williams in the fifth round. It's part of Andy. You've brought up many times your strategy of of getting running backs early because you just love these guys like this in the fifth. Uh, I'm gonna go with a wide receiver who's going even later. The man, the myth, oh the boy. legend. Yeah, seriously, Gabriel Davis. Oh my goodness. Now look, the Bills dun, are dun, dun. <laughs> the Bills are currently the odds-on favorite to win the Super Bowl. This is a great team with a great offense, and yet they lost their number two target in the offense with 114 targets. Oh, and they lost their number three target in the offense with 84 targets. There are 198 missing targets, and they didn't even try to go after some big free agent or spend high draft capital on a rookie wide receiver. Why? Because the answer was already on the team. The Archangel Gabriel Davis. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this is what we're doing? The Bills knew this last year. This wasn't something they figured out once their free agents left. They knew this midseason. The first eight weeks of last year, we remember how good Emmanuel Sanders was. He was great for fantasy. He was winning people DFS tournaments. He was averaging 83.5% of the snaps, including three games, with 90% snap share. Like, he was an every down, receiving down player. Meanwhile, Gabe Davis during that time was seeing 35% of the snaps, wasn't really involved. But then a change happened after week nine. And Emmanuel Sanders started to take a back seat. He never cracked 80% again. He averaged 60% of the, the snaps the rest of the way, while Gabriel Davis averaged 66% of the snaps. There was a change in this offense that allowed Gabriel Davis to step forward and get seen like, is this the dude going forward? It gets better. In four games without Emmanuel Sanders, Gabriel Davis was 87.7% of the snaps. There's no one on this roster that can play the big body downfield type. That's Gabe Davis's role 100%. He's going to be a nearly every down receiving down player. But the most important games of their season – when it mattered to the Bills the most was in the playoffs. Both Emmanuel Sanders and Gabe Davis were active, were healthy, and there to play. And Emmanuel Sanders played 36% of the snaps. Gabriel Davis played 77% of the snaps, and he dominated in the playoffs. He got the early uh, you know, uh, work in the end zone, got a touchdown against the, pa against the Patriots. Then they blew them out, was unneeded the rest of the game. And then in one of the greatest games of all time, if you don't remember, yes. Gabriel Davis – had eight receptions for 201 yards and four touchdowns <laughs> against the Chiefs. Ah, uh, yes. You don't need to trust me and my belief in Gabriel Davis, but you should trust the Bills because they trust Gabe Davis. But don't just minimize the postseason performance. Oh, he just – it's all on that playoff performance. It's not. Gabriel Davis has only been in the league two years. He has barely been a starter, and in regular season games, he has 13 receiving touchdowns. That is 
only behind Justin Jefferson from that draft class. That's more than CeeDee Lamb, more than T. Higgins, and he's barely been a starter. He is a true touchdown threat because in the end zone, that's the guy that Josh Allen looks for. Over the last two years, Gabriel Davis has 23 end zone targets. That is more than Devontae Adams or Cooper Cup. I mean, that is outrageous. When Gabriel Davis played without Emmanuel Sanders, he was on target for 132 uh, targets and 13 touchdowns. That was his pace. He doesn't have Emmanuel Sanders. And if you look at where these guys or where Gabriel Davis is being drafted right now in your home leagues on sleeper, he is in the middle of the seventh round. He is the wide receiver 34 being drafted. Look at what the pros are doing in the high stakes money league on FFPC, the main event. In the main event, his ADP is in the middle of the fourth round as a wide receiver, too. He should not be in the seventh, but he is. Grab him every single time. I would say in the sixth round, I am happy to take him there, too. He will not pass the seventh round ever. I don't care who else is on the board. If I'm in a league in the seventh round, he's on my roster. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you were uh, following the show, uh, last week, or it was in the last couple of weeks, there was an absolute tragedy. A travesty occurred on this show. We were talking about our top 10 wide receivers, and this guy cracked in there. And then I was blindsided when my colleague decided yes. that he was trying to claim that well, there's, some, you, there's some adultery. He going tried on. to claim that, well, now I'm the mayor now, but you are not the mayor, Jason. We built this <laughs> I am the mayor of Pity City. Best took, friends forever. You took the graphic back. That's my graphic. We're going again. We built this city. That's my graphic, baby. Ridiculous. We're back. Michael Pittman of the Indianapolis Colts. He is my final, my guy. And this one, look, the ADP is tough for Michael Pittman because you are drafting him saying he is absolutely doing it this year. Being drafted as a uh, the wide receiver 13 on sleeper, wide receiver 12 over on underdog. Here's what we know. Last year was a breakout for Michael Pittman, drafted as the wide receiver 45, finished in the top 15. He became one of seven second-year wide receivers since 2010 to put up a line of 85, 1,006. Those names who put up huge production in their second year, A.J. Green, Alshon Jeffrey, Josh Gordon, Odell Beckham, Juju, Justin Jefferson, and Michael Pittman. Over the last decade, players drafted in the first two rounds of the NFL draft, if they're going into that third year and they see 120-plus targets, they finish as the wide receiver 10 on average. So even though that ADP feels scary like you're drafting him at his ceiling, I do not think you are because you have the transition of Carson Wentz to Matt Ryan. And you're like, well, Carson Wentz's numbers at the end of the season look pretty pretty good. Two but, more touchdowns but than they, Matt Ryan. But they actually were they're hollow stats where you look at Matt Ryan versus Carson Wentz in every area of when you start breaking things down, like clean pocket, pressure in his face. Like Matt Ryan is a more accurate quarterback. Of the 129 targets that Michael Pittman saw last year, only 99 of them were deemed catchable. That's 77%. That's 44th at the wide receiver position. Michael Pittman was not getting quality graphics or quality graphics, quality targets from Carson Wentz. And now you get Matt Ryan, who look at historically, just like the, the argument for Cortland Sutton of uh, uh, that Russell Wilson has QB1s or wide receiver ones. I'm falling apart, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so excited we're hitting it. We built this city. Matt Ryan, and you think, well, it's all Julio Jones, but it's not. Roddy White was an absolute electric star for fantasy football, finishing as the wide receiver four, seven, one, six. Then both Roddy and Julio Jones finished as top 12 guys. Then Julio went on his tear, and then Calvin Ridley went on a tear there for a short amount of time before we unfortunately lost him to the, the, the NFL Last year, it was a bunch of jabronis. Matt Ryan had nothing to work with with the Atlanta Falcons. I believe Michael Pittman is an elite wide receiver. You get an accurate quarterback, and now you have Frank Reich himself, the head coach, talking about, 
We can't just be a ground and pound team. We got to be able to keep up with the big dogs when it comes to the passing attack. That's why they went and got Matt Ryan. It's definitely why they so, got rid of Carson Wentz. For I sure. am I am pushing the chips. I'm all in on Michael Pittman. Well, I'm glad you like my guy, Mike. Uh, no, I mean, you, yeah. Uh, obviously, I love him. I think Michael Pittman is the dude. Like, he is that dude. He is that dude that's just going to go out there and fight a DB for the ball and then fight him after practice, fight him after the game. There's been a lot of fighting with Michael Pittman in, in camp so far. Yeah, I want that from my wide receivers. He's, he's feisty. Okay. Yeah, just keep it under control. Oh, he keeps it under control. I mean, Pity City, do they have a they got a police force and stuff, right? Yeah, we have we have zero, zero tolerance for bums. Okay. <laughs> and he shuts them down. Torching the Detroit Lions. Did Jay, when Jason had the mayoral position briefly, did he have any tolerance for bums? Oh, no, bums? of course not. Now, we are in agreement about Michael Pittman and Pity City. It is a clean place to live. There may or may not have been Get a the moment. Hobos out. There may have been a moment <laughs> in the show where, or I'm sorry, in the studio. Yeah. Where, um, <laughs> look, look, peel back the curtain. When, we, when we're working through my guys all off season, we have a board. And, and if you have a name up there before somebody else, it's, it's your guy. We, we lay claims and they change and they move and they, and, and Mike, Mike just walked over and wrote Michael Pittman down. Mike and I were both <laughs> two thirds of the way locked in and we were both working on our third guy and I was so close to going Pittman and he walks over and he writes it up on that And board. Mike, <laughs> Mike was, tortured him. I was so angry. Jason overturned every chair in the office yeah, and, yes and left the building and didn't come back. <laughs> That is that is, actually what happened? That is actually That's what why happened. you were never in the video again. That's right, because I freaking <laughs> took off. I was pissed. All right, Allen Robinson, A.J. Dillon, Mike Williams, my three, my guys, Jalen Hurts, Chase Edmonds, Gabe Davis, Jason's three, my guys, Cortland Sutton, Allen Lazard, Michael Pittman Jr., Mike running a trips offense here on the my guys with three wide outs. And S surprised myself with it. Yeah. But here yeah. we are. Uh, one more segment today, though. Best Ball Breakdown, presented by Underdog Fantasy. All right, uh, every week leading up to the season, we've been giving you some insights, tips, reminders, observations, things to inform and help you as you play best ball on Underdog Fantasy, which has grown more and more popular, a lot more entries this year. And we get this question all the time, like how do you approach tournaments, right? You got Best Ball Mania versus... 12 man leagues that you play, you know, traditional best ball leagues. And the reminder here, the message today is just you got, you have to remember that there's a difference in approach, mm -hmm. right? Um, the money on the line is different, um, but also the player pools and the game theory behind how you approach these is very different. We've talked a lot about the approach in normal 12 team leagues in best ball. We've talked about basic roster construction and the kind of what you want to aim for that two to three quarterbacks, five to six running backs, seven plus wide receivers, two to three tight ends. Best ball mania is a different beast, right? You've got a huge prize pool. You've got thousands and thousands of people that fill that tournament. And if you were to make it to week 17, that final, uh, the final chance, you're talking about a top 1% outcome, right? You have 451,000 plus entries. And at that point, it's a one-week DFS tournament. And I think one thing that kind of stood out to me when thinking about the bigger tournaments was, you know, what players are you taking past pick 200 in your best ball drafts that have the ability to really move the needle for your roster? And if they hit, turn you into a competitor, turn you into a one percenter. Last year, those players were you know, Hunter Renfro was a huge part of, of teams that advanced, sure. but was only on 34% of rosters. Elijah Mitchell, Tim Patrick, Cordero Patterson, under 10% of, of the field. It's hard to remember last year that, the, the like, Elijah Mitchell was just undrafted. Compl I mean, he was less than, you know, he was 5% of all the entries actually even Trey drafted was him. was the guy. Yeah, and so it's like, you got to, with that last pick, if you're in the best ball, you want to be unique. You want to be different. Grab a, don't just grab whoever's next highest in the ADP. Go look at a player that you can make an argument for like, man, this guy could emerge and get something that nobody else has. Let me give you a couple examples too. You want to pass on the AJ Green at 197 overall because the, the, 
the best is definitely not to come for A.J. Green. You could turn to rookie Kyle Phillips, who's mm -hmm. been getting a lot of you know slot play in Tennessee. Um, Valus Jones in Chicago. You know Nikhil Harry's injured. Instead of taking the Sony Michelle, maybe the backup gets a split work. You know in Miami, who's going at two thirteen. You could look at a Joshua Kelly. Right, an injury to um, to Austin Eckler would be significant. You could look at Travis Homer. There's ambiguity in the backfield in Seattle with injuries. You just want to give yourself the shot at an Elijah Mitchell, Cordero, Tim Patrick, somebody that makes a humongous difference to move you on as opposed to taking the really vanilla late, late, late pick. Yeah, and you would never do that in a normal 12-team league. You just Correct. Want, you want to get the guys that you know are going to play because you only have to beat 11 people. You got it. So that was Best Ball Breakdown presented by our friends at Underdog Fantasy. A reminder, if you want to start playing on Underdog today, they will match your first deposit up to $100 if you use the code BALLERS. Ballers. That is it for today's episode. We got some breaking news in the middle of it. We got nine new My Guys, some fresh My Guys for 2022. Thank you for joining us and hit ultimatedraftkit.com for that promotion. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.